Anyway, these, cross, I think we're at this point, uh, these are all things that can readily cross-pollinate. Most of them, this is, that is again technical jargon, there are things which are outcrossers, there are things which are obligate outcrossers. That means it not only can cross, but it has to cross. It cannot uh, pollinate itself. Uh, for example, fava beans can cross-pollinate pretty readily, mainly with bumblebees. But they can also self-pollinate. So that helps me um, when I have a strategy of, like when I've maintained my, my fava bean collection, sometimes I've made a huge big tent of um, uh, Elmar Plantex, like basically cheesecloth, cotton cloth. Make a big, with hoops, make a big underground, a big tent like I can crawl into. And I may have 50 varieties of fava beans in there. As long as I don't let one bumblebee get into that tent, they're all going to be pure. There's no one flying from one to the other to cross them up. Okay? It works because they can do it to themselves. As opposed to, I'm getting way ahead of myself here, but it's probably okay. Carrots. If I have some second year carrots, and I have they, several different varieties, and I've, I grow them in cages, usually. Not only because they don't want them crossing with each other, but I imagine around here you probably also have a lot of Queen Anne's lace, mm -hmm. which is, they call it wild carrot, technically it's feral carrot. It's gone wild from domestic carrots, and it'll mess everything up. So, in that case, I put them in cages. Well, that keeps the pollinators away. That's just wonderful. But the problem is, without some pollinators there, I won't get any seed. Every seed I get will be completely pure, which will be none, because they won't pollinate themselves. By the way, you need more than you need two or more plants because again they have this anti-incest mechanism. They won't do it to themselves. So even though you got boy and girl parts, so you've got to have at least two plants. Might give you enough seed for the county, but one plant will probably give you none. So um, okay, so I have them in a cage, and I've got 20 carrot plants, let's say, and they're not going to set seed at all unless I've got something in there to pollinate them. But I don't want them to cross pollinate. You with me so far? I want them to do it with themselves, but not no other carrots. Well. Um, this is way ahead. I usually just come toward the end, but we've got a lot of time, so I'm not worried about it. Um, hopefully most of you people are much too sensible to get into the situation where you're trying to save, you know, 20 or 30 varieties of carrots a year. But if you end up, if you're like me and you do everything, you know, overboard, then you need to find some way of keeping these... Well, one way that plant breeders do is to go into that cage area with a little, like, a, like an artist paintbrush or a Q-tip or something, and like this, you know, that's what a plant breeder does. Uh, if you try to do any amount that way, your seed's going to cost you, like, you know, 50 cents a piece or something or whatever. But if you're just plant breeding, then it doesn't matter. Your cost doesn't, you know, you'll do a lot. Of it. But that's not for you and me, that's not practical. Some other way of doing it. Well, you can introduce pollinators into it. Don't let the wild guys in, but get some uh, pollinators that are... Well, I found out that each of the different crops of these crops has their preferred pollinator. Like the brassicas, like kale and stuff, they really prefer... Their best pollinator is honeybees. Baba beans and runner beans, their best pollinator is... Um, bumblebees. The uh, carrot, parsnip, that family of things, the best pollinator is surfeit wasps. A lot of them have their own. But if, like me, you're doing 20 different species and you really like to have one pollinator fits all, the best one, I'm told, and experience confirms this, the best one is generally not the best for any of them. But if you want the one that's best for all of them, okay, a schmoo variety, you know, a pollinator will work. It is, get this, it is the common house fly. Now, I know, I know, none of you, of course, I'm not suggesting any of you have house flies around your place, no, no. But, but if you have some house flies, they'll do the job for you, for your carrots and your kale and your onions and so on, okay? But, okay, so you're going to go cap, trap some house flies around your place and put them in it? No, no, no. They already have dirty pinkies. It won't work, okay? They're polluted. Don't mess it up. You need to start with, okay, I'm sorry about that. You need to start with maggots, or technically larvae, okay? And, I, and, and so, well, I checked with the people in Ames, Iowa, the, the, the woman that is responsible for their pollination. She was extremely helpful. She told me a lot of things I really didn't want to know, and you don't either. But <laughs> <laughs> she told me that you can grow your own fly cubie. It's cool. Yeah, and, and it, 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 it involves pieces of rotting meat and yep. straws. So you don't want me to go any further, right? Okay. So, but there's another alternative, okay? You can buy, hey, this is America. You can buy fly pupae from insectiaries. I get my Ventura, California insectiaries, they sell, and they're amazingly cheap for flies. They're like $25 to get you 1500 Second day air, they come in a little styrofoam container. The UPS guy hands it to you, the hatching out when they arrive, hands it to you and backs off real carefully. And, and you get these guys, and you go to the cage, and you put, you know, like a little, you know, a couple dozen little pupae 
in, in each of these uh, cages and close it right up again so none of the riffraff can get in there. They put them in there usually with a little Dixie cup with a little uh, half spoonful of molasses in there for a coming out party because when they, they're just hatching out now and maybe a couple of days before they, the, the carrots or whatever make enough nectar. So you put something in there to keep them going until the real you know, up feast begins. <laughs> that's great. Oh, none of you, could, don't, you should not try this in your own home. But that's one way of doing it and uh, yeah. Is the carrot going to make seed in the second year? Yes. Well, that's no, another, we're going to get to that point. Yes, yes, okay. I'm going to get there, Lee. Shut up and let me get, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, a, that, that's the second aspect of which is extremely important. Yes, the second year. Um, and, I'm, and therefore assume that I'm talking about carrots that have been overwintered in the cellar in the ground and they're their second year. Otherwise, this part of the conversation would be irrelevant. Right. That's why I'm the order I'm doing this in. Is, yeah. Um, so uh, that's, that's one way of doing it. Um, the simplest way with most crops of maintaining purity, keeping them pure, is to isolate them simply by distance. You know, it's not rocket science. How much distance? Um, for example, let's say you've got oh, a cucumber. Let's say, uh, let's say a squash variety. This is going to work nicer. A squash variety. And you'd like to save seed. Let's say your pumpkins. You want to save seed of it. And you also have some zucchini. You want to get some seed from your zucchini. Well, you've got a big problem here. Okay. They're both cucurbit and pepo. The, the nice thing about squash is they fall into three different uh, species. Uh, pepo, which includes uh, all the summer squash, zucchini, yellow, patty pan, those, okay? plus acorn squash is the only one of the quote winter squashes, uh, spaghetti squash, and all the true pumpkins. They will all cross with each other. Okay, that's a problem. Keep that in mind. But there are also the cucurbit and maximus, your big winter squash, buttercup, hubbard, uh, banana, those big squashes, they will cross with each other, but not with the pepos. And the third species, which you guys know better than I do, it seems like everyone in the state of Connecticut and Rhode Island grows poop loads of, of butter cup, butternut squash. Yeah, that's such a minor thing. Everyone down here says like, that people talk about that's the main market thing is for butter cup, butter nut cup butter. Butter. Yeah, butter. <laughs> Thank you, butternut squash. You can have a big neck and uh, yeah. And uh, that's, uh, that's a moschata. So they will not cross with either of the others. If you tried growing more than one variety of butter nut squash, like if you were growing Waltham and let's say Ponca and, or any of the others, then you'd have a problem. But uh, that, that's relatively easy. So I'm saying by knowing this fact about what species it's in, you could in any given year, just with one garden, one isolation, you could plant your zucchini and some butter nut squash and some buttercup squash and they'd all be perfectly fine. And if you had another isolation, you know, like hundreds of yards away, then you could also grow your, um, your patty pan squash and your blue hubbard squash and a different variety of butternut, okay? So the, in this case, it helps you to know, you don't necessarily have to be able to pronounce the Latin name right, but if you know which things are and which are not species. Just for example, it's very helpful if you know that um, beets and chard, beta vulgaris, are the same species. As I mentioned before, they will cross readily. If you know that the so-called cabbage family, Brassica oleracea, it's not a family at all, it's the same species. It includes kale, um, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, collards, kohlrabi, um, maybe I'm forgetting something. Those are all... Cauliflower. All hmm? Cauliflower. Cauliflower, there we go. Uh, collards, yeah, anyway. Those will all cross readily. Again, we see them as different food crops. They see each other as, as bed partners. And so they would have to be isolated. You, you, what's worse than having two varieties of cabbage crossed with each other is cabbage crossing with your broccoli. You'll end up with something that's totally useful, useless for your purpose. <laughs> so, so it, 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 yeah. So that problem is only for the next year after you save the seeds? Exactly. That doesn't happen. You already grow kale growing, and broccoli right? in the same right. garden. You don't have a problem. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. 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 It's, you don't get pregnant sitting next to someone on the bus. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they can grow in the same Are garden. Are you sure? Not, not <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, the second, it's when they're doing their sexing, whatever that is. And these biennials, the good thing about these biennials, the first year, they're, they're teenagers. Well, no, they're pre-teenagers. They haven't discovered anything yet. So they're just, you know, fattening up. Just, we'll, we'll get to that whole biennial thing in a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, so um, it, it becomes an issue when they get to that stage.